passage, which is always dangerous um, when you are uh, um, working through a text, um, one, if you've been in the church, um, sometimes familiarity um, can become difficult, and um, it's been good for me to be in this text um, this particular um, week as well, and it's a story about lepers. If you're a kid raised in the church, you always heard this story because everyone's trying to teach you, you better be thankful. Um, um, but I think Jesus has something, I think, far greater in mind um, than that, um, even though that's not a, um, a bad thing um, as we come to this uh, particular text. So I'm going to read it. It's from Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. And uh, it's an interesting story. So Jesus is continuing on his way to Jerusalem as we've been through kind of Luke um, in the gospel readings in our lectionary this year. It's gone through the gospel of Luke. Um, as we've been through um, Luke, we're in the section of Luke where Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And so Luke does that in his book. He, he writes a book that um, is for us. It's about Jesus and in this part of thing, he's got this little narrative going that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, which is always helpful um, because Jesus on his way to Jerusalem is Jesus on his way to the cross. So all of that's going on um, here in this text. So Jesus continues on toward Jerusalem. He reached the border between Galilee and Samaria, and he entered a village there, and there were ten men with leprosy. I'll talk about that in a second. They stood at a distance crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And he looked at them and said, well, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. And he fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. Now, this man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I cleanse ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you whole. And um, this is an occurrence in the life of Jesus. You can go back to the first slide. We're just going to go through this um, as um, the story from beginning to end and hopefully set this up because what is Jesus doing? It's kind of odd, um, everything that's going on and Jesus maybe appears to be a little schizophrenic um, here and, and is trying to teach us um, something. So I want to talk a, about that. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's on a border town between Galilee and Samaria and the Samaritans, are, they're, not, they're, they're not really liked uh, by the Jewish people, they're considered outsiders, they're considered foreigners. Well, in this town that he goes to, there's 10 men with leprosy, um, and leprosy is the skin disease. Um, leprosy, um, we don't, I mean, we have variations of that particular disease um, in our day, but uh, one of the things that played itself out in and this day is when you had leprosy, you had skin disease, leprosy, you usually died um, from. Leprosy was contagious. Um, leprosy um, meant that uh, it was mentioned in the book of Leviticus, and I'm going to get to that in a, in a minute. But if you were a, a leper, it meant you were unclean. It meant that you had your own way that you had to enter tabernacle and temple worship um, as um, a leper, and so there's a whole chapter in the book of Leviticus about lepers. Um, but they, they have this skin disease. They stood at a distance crying out. I think one of the things that Jesus is engaging here is the leprosy. And, and you know, it's interesting in the Bible, when we read all of these parables, um, and we read all of these, we never get any names. Very rarely... Do you get names? In fact, one of the rare names is a passage I, I think it was last week, and I wasn't here last week, um, was the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, uh, who was a beggar. You got a name of a man. But if you actually read the parables and even read most of these occurrences of Jesus, you rarely get a name. 
And I think one of the reasons for that is because you, as you read a story, there's supposed to be identification going on. Um, so where there's no name, you can always insert your name into that story. And so here are these lepers. They're unclean, and they stood at a distance, and they stood at a distance because they were unclean. And so most of the time, um, you, if you were around lepers in that day, uh, one of the things you were supposed to do if you were a leper and you were in a group of people, you actually had to shout out, unclean, unclean, unclean. I mean, how would you like to be that? That be your identifier? Unclean, unclean. I don't even have a name. My name is unclean. And so they're at a distance and um, they are crying out, um, to God, they are afar off, and you see that even in the Old Testament, they have to be taken outside the camp. The leper is the isolated one. The leper is the far off one. The leper is the unclean one. The leper is the one who lives in the shadows. The leper is the one who lives in fear, isolated, in the shadows, in fear, afar off. That is the identity and the life of a leper and unclean. So there's these 10 men who are isolated. They are afar off. They live in the shadows. They never have contact with any other part of humanity. They spend most of their life yelling out unclean. They are left outside the social norms. They are left outside of the camp. There are 10 men isolated, afar off, fearful, and cast off, alone in the shadows, and they cry out for mercy. Say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. That word can also actually mean love. They're crying out to be loved. For the people who are isolated and afar off and cast off and live in fear and, and have death staring them in the face. They cry out to Jesus that he would have mercy upon us. Jesus, will you love us? Will you shine your love on the isolated, the far off, the cast off? Will you show your love to the one, to the ones, to the ten who live in the shadows. Jesus looks at them and his response is interesting. All he said was, go show yourself to the priests. A little unlike Jesus' healing miracles. He doesn't pronounce any kind of healing on them. He doesn't... Um, you know, say, you're healed, go show yourself to the priests. So in the Old Testament, when you have leprosy, and you, there was a small chance that you would ever be cured of that leprosy, you actually had to go show yourself to the priests, who then, and that was kind of the, the only the priests could do this, only the religious uh, priests could do this, they would evaluate you, and if you read Leviticus, I forget what chapter it is, you see what the priest does, and then the priest, you know, you meet him, and you go outside the camp, and the priest then has the ability to declare you clean, which means you can come back, and you're not afar off anymore. You're part of the belonging to the people of God and their worship, and you're, you're not any of those things. So he says to them, go show yourself to the priest." He didn't say, you're healed, and go show yourself to the priest. He said, go show yourself to the priest. Now, something remarkable happens. I mean, they actually, here's these guys with leprosy. They actually, um, maybe the priest knew them already. Maybe they don't. I think maybe, maybe they had an act of faith. But as he said, and as they went, it literally is as they were along their way, as they were going along their way, they were cleansed of their leprosy. And you want to look about it and you think, well, this is remarkable. I mean, he says to these 10 guys who are cast-offs, 
go show yourself to the priest. All 10 of them remarkably just obey, and they start on their way to the priest. And, and to me, it, it seems that in the story, it indicates that either they believed they were going to be healed, or did they know they were? I don't know if they knew they were going to be healed, but the one who loved them said to do it, and so they were going to do it, and so they head off to go show themselves to the priest. He didn't pronounce the healing. He just said, go show yourself to the priest. Did they expect to be healed? I think possibly they might have expected to be healed. We're not told. Um, but when they started on their way to see the priest, they were not healed and they were not whole. We know that because the text says that as they were on their way, They were cleansed of their leprosy. What is going on here? So they're cleansed, and they're on their way, and then the story gets a little weirder because one of them, one of them turns back to Jesus. But the other nine don't. And this could be really confusing because Jesus can be confusing here. Because even when the one turns back to Jesus, Jesus says to the one who turned back, well, where are the other nine? Well, Jesus, they're doing what you told them to do. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> where are the other nine? They're, they're, aren't they doing what you told them to do? And yet when Jesus is talking and he asks that question to the one, he asks that question in such a way as that the expectation is that the nine shouldn't be on their way to see the priest. They too should have turned around. And they too should have come. Now, is Jesus expecting everyone to read his mind? Or is he, what, is, what is he doing? And then what happened in the one? Why did the one turn around and the, the nine didn't? And what is like going on in this text? That there's this expectation from Christ. And then, and then, then it seems like the one who turned back was completely blessed by Jesus, which seems to indicate that the other nine were not part or engaged in, in that particular blessing, that, that if, if, if you were morally wanting to be like one of the ten, you want to be like the one who came back. What, what is going on in this particular text. And the first thing I want to touch on, and it's in, important here, and I actually had Ali change the words because I love the, this is the New Living Translation. I actually like it because it, it makes everything easy to read. Um, but sometimes when you're, when you stick truer to what the original said, it actually helps you understand the text. Um, so they look down and as they went, is a key word here, they were cleansed. It does not say, and it was part of it, okay, so I'm not saying they weren't. It does not say they were healed. Something happened more than just healed. They were healed. Their leprosy was gone. So that was true. All ten of them, their leprosy was gone. But there is something about this word cleansed that went way farther than any physical healing that happened to these men. To be cleansed in the religious, in the religious uh, temple sense that the people of God would have known would meant that your, your sins were forgiven. That you've been made whole, that you just weren't you just weren't physically healed of this leprosy, that something deeper happened that didn't just happen to their physical appearance, that as they went and as Jesus has sent them on their way, there was this reality that their sins were forgiven and they were cleansed. And I think that begins to help us understand what is going on. Because in the Old Testament, if you actually went to the book of Leviticus, there, there's a lot going on here. I'm not going to get into um, what, what's all going on here. But if you went back to the book of Leviticus, 
one of the reasons they would go back after they'd been cured of the leprosy is who declared them to be clean? The priests declared them to be clean. The priests decided if they were truly clean or not. Something happened as they went on their way that the one knew that what had happened was far more than that he was healed. And he needed to go back to the one who could for all time and eternity without fail declare him to be clean. They were cleansed, forgiven. If you were a leper in the Old Testament and you were declared to be clean, you were declared to be clean and you were no longer unclean um, because you didn't have leprosy anymore, but to be considered cleansed and clean meant you had access to God. You had access to his gifts. You had access to worship again. If you were unclean, you had been denied that access to God and that access to worship. But when the priest declared you clean you, and you were cleansed, you had access to God and you had access to his gifts. When Jesus says as they were going on their way that they were cleansed of their leprosy, the one immediately knew that he had some kind of access to his God that he had never had before. He knew it was immediate. He knew he no longer needed to go to the temple for that, ask, for that declaration. He knew he needed no longer to go to an earthly priest for that declaration. Something in the cleansing let him know that his full access to God and the gifts of God were in the man that had mercy on him. And so he turned around to come back to that man. You can go to the next slide. It's interesting, the play on words here. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, and the Greek word there is healed, <laughs> So he is seeing that he is actually physically healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. And he fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. And this man was a Samaritan. Go back to the other slide, the first slide. This is, was it in the Greek? I actually... Had Ali remove it, but then I put it back in because I want to make a point, and then I forgot to make the point. In the Greek, in the original language, when it says there in the last line, and as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. In the original language, there is no of their leprosy. It literally says, and as they went, they were cleansed, period. I think we need to help people, and I think we might be hurtful because something far more is going on that the original languages don't say. Now, they were cleansed, and they were healed of their leprosy, but there's something far more going on. You go back to the next slide now, and so he comes and says, let me be healed, and this man um, was, was a Samaritan, and he, he's shouting, and he's, he's happy, and he's worshiping God, and go to the next slide, and Jesus said, didn't... In then this particular language, Jesus asks, didn't I heal ten men? The original doesn't use the word heal. That was a different word. It says, didn't I cleanse ten men? I think to understand this story and understand what is going on with the one who has come back to Jesus, this has to be much more than just a healing it has to go deeper, and I think that's what Jesus is doing um, as the man um, turns around. So what is going on? And I, sometimes I get too heady, and I don't want to be too heady. Um, Jesus said, go to the priest. Go to the tabernacle. Go to the temple. That's what the law said um, to do. The one chooses not to do that. 
I do think in the one who turns around and comes to Jesus, he actually begins to understand that the law, it can make statements about you, but it can't love you. The law can tell you when you're doing something wrong. The law does a pretty good job of judging us. But they asked for love, and they asked for mercy, and the law doesn't give mercy, and the law doesn't give love. It tells us what we have done wrong, and it communicates that very, very clearly. On Friday, I had... um, I got together and had, um, I would say I had coffee, but I don't drink coffee, um, with one of my son's roommates in Minnesota, who's a Jew. I mean, he's practicing, and he's going to become a rabbi, and he wanted to talk to me because he wants to become a rabbi. And he wants to know, well, what's, what's, what's the difference What's the, the, the difference? And one of the things I drew out was this idea that, that the law, we, we all believe in the law, the Torah that God has given to us. He gave it to us on Mount Sinai. He, he gave it to us in Moses. But the, the law can't engender um, the love. And it was fascinating as I, I talked to him because they said, if you really, if you want a one-sentence summary, if you want a su- one-sentence summary about what I believe the whole of the Bible teaches and what maybe you are left with, and it was a very cordial conversation, it wasn't highly charged or anything like that, is, and his, his name was, was Ethan, and I said to Ethan, I said, Ethan, you have a religion of do, and I believe Christianity is about done. There's a world of difference. He then went on to say, I guess they just, uh, they just celebrated Yom Kippur, which is their day of atonement. And I said, well, what do you, what do, you do with the forgiveness of sins? What, what do you do with repentance? What do you do with the forgiveness of sins? And he said, well, like two weeks ago, and he named the name, and I, I, I don't know all of those names, but they, they kind of had their reckoning for the year. And they kind of weigh the good with the bad, And where they're found wanting, then they've got 10 days to do acts of love and acts of service before Yom Kippur, which is their day of atonement, when the book is finally sealed. And I I, I said to him, I said, and and how how do you feel? And he felt pretty good about it. He he felt really good, you know. He felt like he'd had a good 10 days. Um, and he felt like he'd uh, accomplished a lot, and he felt comfortable um, in, in the idea of, of his works being sealed, and they're now sealed for another year, and he gets another chance to, to kind of build on that and to, to do it over. But in, in the midst of it, you know, one of the things he said to me, he said he'd never heard of the do and the done. You know what he said? He goes, Brad, that's beautiful. Well, it is beautiful. Who wants to live in the world of do when the law is constantly, and Jesus, Jesus he takes the law and the Sermon on the Mount. He says, well, if you hate your brother, you've killed him. You've lusted after a woman. You've committed, I mean, he basically, no one's left standing after the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is saying something here about himself. That this man who has faith sees that the other nine do not. See, the other nine can go back to the temple. I don't know, I couldn't, I've wrestled with this word because I wouldn't necessarily use the word faith, but I'll use it in the word faith because faith also engenders trust. And it has that element to it. But, but what was wrong with the nine is their faith, their trust, what they were trusting in pointed them in the wrong direction. 
They went the wrong direction. Now you say, well, Jesus said that you needed to go, but there, there's something that happens in forgiveness and cleanliness that as Jesus was doing and Jesus was teaching um, and then teaching us through the one who returned um, and, and their faith had taken them, uh, they actually continued away from Jesus. If you want the vernacular of what we do in our day and age, their cleansing all began with Jesus, right? The cleansing all began with Jesus. But Paul has written many books in the New Testament that we do the same thing. We, we begin with Jesus, and there isn't a person in this room who isn't somewhat of an evangelical who wouldn't say, well, yes, my Christian life has begun with Jesus, but now I'm going to go run to the law. I'm going to go run to religion. We begin with Jesus, and then we run to religion. You know what the difference of the 10th person was? He began with Jesus, and there was no way he wasn't going to end with Jesus, who is both the author and the finisher of his faith. You know what the 10th person believed? That Jesus plus nothing is everything. That's the difference. Jesus began with Jesus, and I'm going to end this thing with Jesus because he's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end, and he's everything. This is beautiful. This is the beautiful check. What the tenth person believes is that what Jesus begins, he finishes. What he believes and what he comes back with confidence and giddiness with is his confidence that he who has begun the cleansing work in him will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Is this about obedience? Is this about thankfulness? I don't even know who the obedient people are in this passage. I mean, it seems like the nine are obeying. The tenth does something that's far, doesn't even mention obedience and him turning around. But he comes back and he is thankful. Because thankfulness, gratefulness comes. When Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And, you know, I think sometimes even as I was raised with the thankfulness of this passage, we, we, we come up with a rote thankfulness. You know, I got an A on my paper. Oh, I'm so thankful, God. Thank you, God. And, and it's okay to thank you, God, for, for the A on your paper. It is. It is okay to do that. Thank you, God. I scored a touchdown. Okay, we gave you gifts to do that um, as well. You can even see a beautiful sunset here on the nature coast and say, thank you, God, for your utter display of glory in that sunset. And that would be completely appropriate, right? The one who created and gave us the sunset. But listen... This man was not only a leper, he was a Samaritan. He was a dead duck twice. And what you see in him is a thankfulness because he knows that what has happened to him in the Jesus plus nothing is so stunning and so glorious and so amazing gracious. 
that he comes and worships at the feet of Jesus. For us this morning, you're far off. You know, I just wrote, I wrote this down this week that in the midst of my own poor choices in my life, my own poor choices this week, in the midst of a train wreck that is my story, that is my family, that is my children, that is all of those things. Jesus, on my way, and on your way and in your story, it is declared that your sins are forgiven. And the response to that will always leave you at the feet of Jesus. Because from another story of Jesus, he who has been forgiven much, loves much. For by grace, we have been saved through faith. And that faith is not of yourselves, but it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man. The one who is afar off, the one who is a train wreck, the one who is a Samaritan, the one who had nowhere to go, ran to his identity. He ran to the one who had given him a new life. He ran to the one who had given him a new name. He ran to Jesus. You see, it's not religion that could ever cleanse us and ever heal us. Your and I's cleansing is not contingent on coming to church. Yours and I's cleansing is not contingent on getting involved in some religious do-do practice. Our cleansing is contingent upon the promise of God. And he does. some reason the tenth guy got that. We abuse the end of the passage and you know your faith has healed you and you know then we live in a day where if you're fighting something and you have a sickness and you're not healed then what do people say? You don't have enough faith and then we get into the whole religion thing again where it becomes all about you and not the promises of God. You guys can come up now. I'm really going to be done here. Is Jay playing at the end? Okay. I mean, come up. If you've been here long, long enough, one of the things I've always said, because we have such, we, we so skew the word faith, and faith becomes kind of this uh, abstract, you know, well, I had faith in God and I scored a touchdown, you know, or I had faith in God and I got an A on the test, uh, you know, and that was kind of this faith that's kind of my lucky charm. Um, that, um, that that's kind of good for us. But one of the things I've said, and if you're new here, I would just challenge you that every time you see the word faith in Scripture, substitute this word or these words for it. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's the definition of faith. So at the end, when he says to the one, the tenth lever who's worshiping on his feet, he says, rise up and go. Your Jesus plus nothing equals everything has saved you. It's made you whole. The other way you can read that last sentence is stand up 
and go because your Jesus has saved you. And I don't know what happened in that guy's walk as he was going. But I do know that what he knew that began with the one whom he asked mercy for is the one he was going to end it with. You begin with Jesus. And you end with Jesus. Otherwise, all you have is religion. And all you have is yourself. And all you have is do. When it's done. I mentioned a few weeks ago, you go to Episcopal churches and their doors are red. When you come in, you immediately know you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. One of the attentional ways our church is set up is that when you walk in that front door, the first words you see are, it is finished. And when we come back to Jesus, because there was something happened in his cleansing that he knew it was finished. And all he wanted to do be at the feet of the one who had finished him.